Hello and welcome to the Apologetics 315 podcast with your hosts, Brian Auten and Chad Gross. Join us for conversations and interviews on the topics of apologetics, evangelism, and the Christian worldview. What do people think about when they hear the phrase spiritual warfare? What's been your experience? Has it been charismatic or non-charismatic? And what has that experience looked like? Are you open to it or close to it? Today, we're going to be talking to Dr. Carl Payne. He's a pastor, a teacher, a speaker, author, and he's a former NFL chaplain. He was originally closed to the whole idea of spiritual warfare. He is not charismatic, but he had some experiences in his pastoring, which totally changed his mind. So he's the author of a book called Spiritual Warfare, Christians, Demonization and Deliverance. And in my judgment, this is the go-to book for Christians when it comes to a balanced, thoughtful solid and thorough treatment of the subject with sound and practical application for all disciples of Jesus. So a little bit more about Dr. Carl Payne. He's currently on staff at Antioch Bible Church in Redmond, Washington. His primary role is serving as the pastor of leadership development and discipleship training. He served as a chaplain for the Seattle Seahawks football team from 1994 through 2015. This is Brian Auten, and I'm here with Chad Gross, I'm looking forward to this interview, Chad. It'll be a little bit different than our normal ones. Yeah, I'm really hoping it's going to bring clarity to the, these types of issues, you know, Christians, demonization and deliverance. I was super impressed with this book. I thought it was a very, as it addressed these topics, as grounded as you can and as biblically as you can. I think I mentioned to you after you sent it to me that as I was reading it, I, it, it almost reads... Uh, like a commentary on this topic, but an interesting commentary. But it's just so biblically rich that you you feel like you're doing an in-depth Bible study. And yeah. I think that's that's that should commend the book to listeners. And of course, if Dr. Payne listens to this, hopefully he sees that or feels that's a compliment because it certainly is. And so I'm really interested in in kind of unpacking it a little bit. This is a topic that is so much for me something I've personally looked into, but I also know there's so many various views on it. And like you said in the earlier that you've got people who are very conservative and almost pretend like demonization isn't even a thing. Demons don't even exist. But then on the other side of the spectrum, you've got people who if they can't find their car keys, it's because a demon hit yeah. them, you know? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I think this interview will serve to bring clarity to kind of both extremes and mm -hmm. uh, provide a real balanced view. Yeah. For the listener, uh, I love what you said there, Chad, about clarity. If I had one word to, to describe what I'm hoping to achieve is to bring balance. Uh, your word is clarity. Mine is balance. I think that works to, together great. First right. off, from an apologist's perspective, my thoughts are that it can be easy to intellectualize things so much that we apply that same sort of intellectualization <laughs> to everything spiritual. So we can... Mm -hmm start to ignore the very spiritual realities we're dealing with, whether in our own lives or in the lives of brothers and sisters in Christ or in the lives of those who we want to share the gospel with. So, you know, to remind us of Ephesians 6, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Second thing is, you know, I came from a charismatic background or I grew up, grew up in that sort of background. In my experience, things were done in a, if you want to describe it, I'd say maybe haphazard, kind of questionable. It made me question this Maybe this is just hype, emotion, people getting worked up into a frenzy, you know, when it comes to like casting out demons. Yet at the same time, I couldn't deny that even people that I had prayed for were dealing with more than just mental issues. You know, I have witnessed sort of what you might call a demonic manifestations and things of that sort. And from people who would not would or not have expected. I, I may maybe I've told this story to you before where I was on the mission field and, you know, uh, in Malaysia. And maybe within the first few days I was there, I was asked to go into this little village and do a talk. And I had a translator. Nobody spoke English to the people I was speaking with. But one woman, she started to writhe around on the floor and scream. And like she was clearly uh, not having a mental issue. It was what looked like she was manifesting demons. So, I mean, I was praying for her in the name of Jesus, casting out demons, saying, come out of her right now, let her go. And, you know, after 
a short time of prayer, she was set free and she was she was up on her feet and crying and thanking Jesus. And she didn't know what I was saying. <laughs> she didn't understand English. Um, but my prayers seemed to liberate her. Oh. And it, it was not a sort of an instance where everybody was doing that. So she was following suit or something like that. So certain experiences I've had seemed to indicate to me like at the, you know, even when I was like 20, okay, yeah, there's something going on here. And, and all the maybe shenanigans or circus sort of men, things you might see through charismania, if you want to call it that. And as Eric Manning said, I'm, I'm a charismatic, so I can say that, yeah. you know, y- you can say, well, here's all this crazy stuff. I'm just going to write it all off. Well, I couldn't do that. But then I found this book by Carl Payne. And I'm like, ah, finally, someone who came from not a charismatic background, encountering sort of demonic oppression, being able to learn sort of as he went, how do I deal with this in real realities in people's lives, praying for them and, and ministering to them and pastoring them to set them free from bondages or torments or habitual sort of chronic uh, mental anguish of different sorts. So really interesting. And first I read, you know, heard the audiobook, Then I read like the Kindle version and then I get the paper one and I'm like, hey, I didn't see all these endorsements. There's like 60. I counted them. There's 66 endorsements at the beginning of the book. Wow. By all kinds of big names. I'm like, this is like 10 pages of endorsements by like dudes, respectable scholars. So it's not like, well, this is just a charismatic press. You know, this is definitely uh, um, you know, the book um, that I would recommend to anyone who's interested in this. And the other thing, and those are two things, you know, apologist perspective coming from a charismatic background. And the third thing is to show, I'm hoping this interview would show that spiritual warfare is not just, you know, casting out demons, but it's learning how to fight against the influences of the world and of the flesh. And so in Dr. Payne's book, he describes very balanced. This is equal, like a pie sliced into three pieces. These are all equal enemies that we have as Christians that we have to learn how to deal with. And so it's not like a, just a deliverance handbook, like here's how you cast out a demon. <laughs> it's 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 a, a handbook for discipleship, really, in spiritual mm-hmm. warfare and dealing with the enemies we have as Christians. So it's not weird and woo woo. It might be strange to those who maybe are uninitiated in the aspects of dealing with demonization in a prayer context, but it is not a circus. It's very calm and very orderly. And I, I really appreciate that because, you know, I came out of certain church experiences where I was like, how do I find balance again? Because I can't deny certain things in my spiritual experience, but I don't want to check my brain at the door and just subscribe to the hype. I know uh, not everybody's like that, but that's the, the realm I came out of. And so really appreciate the work of Dr. Carl Payne. Anyway, his website and further info on Dr. Carl Payne is at transferablecrosstraining.org. Now, he's he's uh, done work in um, the spiritual warfare. He's written this book. He's been in this sort of a ministry, if you want to call it deliverance ministry. But he's really a pastor, a disciple maker. His whole thing is about disciple making. And that's why he's called his website Transferable Cross Training. It's all about the gospel message and transferring that, making that transferable, passing it along. That's why he's also a discipleship trainer. So really appreciate the work he's doing. Chaplain for the NFL, for goodness sake. You know, he knows how to to talk to people and to disciple them. And uh, so we're looking to glean from his many years of wisdom in this area. I think one of the contributions of the book for me is that one of the things that's undeniable about Jesus's ministry, I mean, historical Jesus thinkers even point out the fact that one of the things that large majority of scholars agree on is that Jesus part of Jesus's ministry was a ministry of exorcisms. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we can be tempted as Christians, as you kind of alluded to, to push that to the side and think, oh, you know, that that was just mental illness at the time or something like mm-hmm. that. But I don't think that is a robust enough explanation. And I think Dr. Payne's book does a great job of giving us a very robust biblical view of demonization, oppression, those those types of things, but in a way that is biblically respectable and uh, understandable. And so, and he even talks about how do we tell the difference between something that we would typically call a mental illness versus something that could have a supernatural cause. And so it just really brings, brings, again, I hate to use the word again, but it really brings clarity 
uh, to the issue and helps me at least feel like I don't need to shy away from these texts because they have both intellectual grounding and respectability about them. And I don't have to feel like I'm buying into, like you said, kind of the charismatic over the top kind of view of this topic. All right. Well, let's get ready for the interview. Let's get ready. Switch me on. Carl, thanks for joining us for the podcast. It's a privilege. I'm very happy to be with you, my friend. Yes. Well, first off, can you tell us a bit about your background and pastoring and discipleship and maybe a little bit of the apologetics stuff that you've been involved with? Okay. I don't know maybe the order, I, I may invert it just a little bit. Uh, the apologetics conference is something that uh, I, I just took a, a liking to right off the bat. First apologist I heard was Josh McDowell. I was a new Christian. Uh, I listened to him. I, I may have been a, a college student. I may have been a high schooler who was slipping into the college meetings because I was big for my age. But I just remembered a guy that wasn't apologizing for what he said he believed. And that uh, really struck a chord with me. I wanted to know what I believe and why I believe because when I became a Christian, I was the first Christian in my family. And I was not someone expected at school to become a Christian. And uh, lost most of my friends when I became a Christian. Mm. And uh, uh, I got used to to people kind of taking shots. So when I heard McDowell say, those are just opportunities, kind of pre-evangelism. You remove their excuses because you won't back down. So it kind of started young. Uh, what I've been doing most lately for about the last 20 years, we call it the Worldview Apologetics Conference. I don't know if this is true. I said this is bittersweet, but I had... Uh, I usually bring in four or five speakers that particular year. I had uh, uh, Bill Craig and uh, Josh both there, and they said this is the longest-running apologetics conference in the United States. Wow. And I said, if we started real small, and it's, it's grown big. Now, we've been shut down the last two years because of COVID, because at least in Washington State, we can't have them. So this last year, I just put, I have about 350 talks from people over 20 years and so all I did was I picked out 16 of the talks and I tossed them up and let people just watch. And I said, listen, we can't get together, but uh, we bring in the best we can. I've told them that uh, the Seattle Northwest is, uh, you can include Portland if you want, is pagan and proud of it. <laughs> Far more than other parts of the country or many parts of the country. I know because when we can speak, I'm out speaking and there's not even any pretense in this either. I've said the polarization I think is actually healthy. You're either in or you're out. There's There's certainly no pretense around here. But uh, I was just convinced that uh, we're supposed to contend for the faith. Jude tells us to do that, that we're to provide reasonable answers for reasonable questions. Peter tells us that. Uh, we're to take advantage of the uh, opportunities we get. Paul tells us that in the book of Colossians. And uh, I just have always seen that as a normal part of Christianity. Uh, my dad was a academic. My dad was a, a scientist, a mathematician from high school principal to college professor. Uh, I was taught evolutionary biology before I could even go to school or read. He'd lay out all the pictures for me. And I have said, I think it's a shame I was an adult before I found out there was an alternative to neo-Darwinism for origins. And mm -hmm. I said, even if people agree, to, agree or disagree, to not even know there was an alternative, I had to be an adult before I even heard that. I thought, uh, that's kind of a shame because you uh, clearly have, <laughs> globally, you've got more theists than atheists. I mean, if you they're not all Christian, but to just dismiss sure. that whole group. So I love the apologetics. Uh, I, think, I think that uh, uh, guys are calling them pre-evangelism. Norm's dead now. He's He's been part of the apologetics conference a couple of different times. But anyways, we bring in really good guys. But uh, he used to say that uh, apologetics will not save a person, but they will certainly eliminate the excuses that stand in front of people saying, I will at least listen to the gospel. Mm -hmm. so he says, why not eliminate the excuses with people? Uh, you know, if they really won't, they won't. But a lot of times they're just passing on cliches that they've heard, and they're not used to a Christian challenging those cliches. And when you actually challenge them, you find out what they really know and understand or not. So uh, that would be the situation. The discipleship, I, uh, I've been a pa leader, pastor of discipleship or leadership development for almost 30 years at the church I'm at here, but I was doing the same thing as a youth pastor. I just, that 2 Timothy 2.2 2 really resonated with me, the Matthew 28, 18 to 20, that 
Our job is uh, to make disciples, for people to be able to give away what you've been given. My dad used to say to me, my dad became a Christian nine months before he died, by the way. 32 mm -hmm. years, he told me, I don't wow. need you, Jesus. I don't need any of that. I don't need a son, you know, younger than me telling me, how, you know, that I've missed on life. Nine months before he died, he said, how do I get what you've got? Caught me totally by surprise because wow. he had told me for so long, don't don't bring up the Jesus thing. Praise the and, Lord. Uh, now there's five out of six in my family are Christians where it started one out of six. So there's still one to go. Wow. But, but what Cod Dad used to tell, tell me, he said, good teachers take complex ideas and share them in a way you can understand them. And he said, the teachers that talk over your head and then blame you, uh, saying, you know, they just don't make students like they used to. He said, that's a poor student. That's a poor teacher. Because he said, even if that's the case as a teacher, your responsibility is to figure out how to connect with students unless they just refuse. If they won't, there's nothing you can do about that. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I had seminary professors, Bible professors, some of them better than others. Some of them talked over my head. Some of them talked right to me. Uh, I decided that I was going to try and figure out how to take uh, what I knew to be true you know, from the Bible theologically and lay it out in a way that someone would say, well, if I can do that, you can do that. Uh, that way, both of us are involved in the battle instead of them just looking to another person. I have said, I don't want people attaching an umbilical cord to me. I was never meant to be their God. I want their umbilical cord attached to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, that's good. So just that whole thing, I've, I wrote a, I've written a lot in the area of discipleship. Probably I've spoken more in the area of, of transferable, I call it transferable cross-training. I've got three books and a little series that's used all over the country now. But it's, again, it's simple, it's clean, uh, nothing unique about the verses. If there's anything unique, it's just that I will say, if you're not willing to give away what you learn, then don't don't sit in the class. Uh, there's an expectation when you come in, you're wanting to learn something that you can hand off to somebody else. The spiritual warfare uh, basically flowed out of the same kind of thing. Uh, I certainly was trained. Uh, I was at good schools. I was at Multnomah School of Bible. I was at Western Conservative Baptist Seminary then. Now it's Western Seminary. They, they dumped the Conservative Baptist. But uh, like so many, my buddies at Dallas, my buddies at Grace, Trinity, Moody, it was just ignore this. And so I did. And it wasn't until uh, it was forced on me, basically. I didn't invite it. And I finally thought, you know, I've got a lot of very sincere teachers and colleagues that would say, uh, this is for neurotic people that, uh, you know, won't take responsibility for their own issues. So they, they're either neurotic, they've got mental issues, they want to blame someone else, something else. I taught that same thing. And so as long as you're reading your Bible and memorizing scripture, you should be just fine until you start in as a vocational pastor and find out that you've got people in your church that read their Bible and memorize scripture and they're not just fine. And they constantly feel like they're on the outside looking in and like you're, you're not listening to me and you don't hear me. Uh, you're just assuming I'm making this up or there's something wrong with me. Well, what if I'm telling the truth? And mm -hmm. so I decided when I started writing, and I, uh, Brian, you told me you've read the material I, I have written on spiritually, some of it, I'm sure. Uh, I just thought I want to write it the same way. I want to write it in a way that I'll say it's clean. You can hand it off. You can use it. Uh, if I can do this, you can do this. It's about biblical authority. It's not about uh, whether you read Greek and Hebrew or whether you're a seminary graduate or a Bible student or a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker. It's if Christ lives in you, you've been delegated authority to say, I don't have to be a victim and I'm done being a victim. And then and then laying it out in a way that someone says, I, I understand what, what you're saying. Better than that, I get pastors and missionaries regularly, regularly get a hold of me and say, uh, you've made this simple and it actually works. Well, wow. so I want them saying the same thing about how do you lead someone to Christ? How do you deal with assurance mm -hmm. of your salvation? How do you deal with inerrancy? How do you deal with the creation evolution discussion? You know, what, whatever it is, how, how do you deal with cults? I want material that someone can say, I, I can use that. Then I feel yeah. like I've helped equip them and serve them. If I leave it as I will share this, but, but uh, I, I layer it so deep that you go, I could never do that. I don't think I've helped that person. Mm -hmm. So the apologetics that came out of McDowell early, the discipleship, that's just what I thought the Bible taught. Uh, I've made this statement. You can agree or disagree with me. I said, people involved in discipleship are trainers. I have never met a teacher, a, a, a discipleship trainer who can't teach, but I have met many teachers that don't have a clue how to train. Mm -hmm. uh, the one shares their life until you get it. They won't let go. The other shares content. If you get it, you get a good grade. If you don't get it, you get a bad grade. I have said we need more discipleship trainers 
rather than people just aspiring to teach. Mm -hmm. Um, The one takes responsibility for it landing and being application-oriented, where the other one, I've done it, you know, shares good content. Mm -hmm. But there's no aspiration one way or the other or expectation. Either you get it or you don't, that's on your head. So the teaching, the discipling, the working with the, the spiritual warfare, the training people to say, uh, I said it, I've said it this way, guys. I've just said that I see lessons that I teach as an arrow that go in a quiver over your shoulder. I would rather have the arrows there so if I need them, I can pull it out than to assume I don't need the arrows and then run into the situation and go, man, if I had just paid attention or done some work in this area or that area, they don't hurt a thing carrying them, but they're right. sure helpful if you've got them. I love the discipleship. I like to teach the apologetics. I think that they're, they're well, they're written as an imperative in a number of places. It's commanded mm-hmm. to, to defend your faith. It's not just a suggestion. And the spiritual warfare for me just became one more area where we've been trained to run or, or play the victim. And I've thought that's not what the Bible says. So how about we learn how to stand instead of bow? Hmm. Yeah. Well, we want to focus on the spiritual warfare aspect in this uh, interview. And so that's a great transition. And one of the things that you do in the book is you talk a little bit about how, you know, you're the last person that would have, uh, you know, gone down that road. Like, no, that doesn't concern me. (laughs) That's not something I need to deal with. And then your experience changed that. Now, you're not and you're also you're not coming at it from, uh, you know, that wasn't your background or a charismatic background or anything like that. So can you tell our listeners a bit what changed your view and uh, caused you to confront this? Sure. That's a great question, Brian. And it's a pretty simple answer. Uh, I youth pastored either formally or informally for about 20 years, about 13, 14 years formally as a youth pastor. But I was working with Campus Crusade as a volunteer or young life, you know, as a as a student leader and that kind of thing. So I, I logged about 20 years working with kids, teenagers, high school, college mostly. And uh, in the 1980s, I was youth pastoring in Spokane was very much a product on this uh, topic of the two schools I'd gone to. I had no reason to assume my teachers weren't telling me the truth until in 1982, about two years into it, a young lady that I had no question was born again. Uh, I knew she struggled with speed. She would sometimes go for long periods of time without being involved with drugs, and then she'd come over to my house and say she was going to kill herself because she'd failed God and her family, and she was, you know, clearly, clearly, you know, on speed. And my wife and I would invite her in, and I'd talk to her about the sufficiency of Scripture, and if she'd memorize Scripture and right thinking, you know, if she would have the right things going through her mind instead of wrong things. I told her on several occasions she was just living with a weak will, that she had the ability to stand because God lived in her as a believer, but that she was choosing, and she would say, something pushes me towards this car, you don't understand And I would say, no, I think you don't understand. The one in you is greater. Nothing can push you. You're a believer, et cetera. We went through that routinely. One afternoon, I had a note on my door again that she had slipped there, that uh, she was going to say goodbye. She'd failed again. She came over. My wife and I were both there when she came in, and it just hit me. I I didn't know what I was going to do, but I just said her name. I changed the names. It's not her name in the book. I I don't want anything going back at people. I try to protect their privacy. But but I, I just said I would like to read something to you. Maybe I've been approaching this in a wrong fashion. And uh, I said, I don't, I don't believe that when you say these voices tell you to do things, I don't believe there's voices telling you to do things. I think either there's something not quite right or you're imagining this or you're just doing this to, to you know, make an excuse. I basically gave back at her what I had been taught. But I pulled out my Bible. I started reading in First John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I don't even know how much I knew what it meant or didn't mean, but I knew it said, you know, test the spirits. They're not all from God. And, and uh, I said, uh, I, I want to read this to you. So she said, that's fine. So she's sitting in my front room in a rocker, and uh, I start reading this. And a few verses in, she reaches up and grabs my Bible. And I honestly, I tried to pull it back. I couldn't. I'm a big guy. She started screaming a name and said he hates this book and just started pulling the pages out of my Bible. And then saliva started coming out of her mouth and her fingers got all contorted. And she fell out of the chair on the floor and just went fetal, screaming that her name was something that it wasn't. 
and telling me that uh, I've not publicly shared the name she said. I just make up a name, just Fred, just say Fred hates this book. And I I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus, uh, leave her alone. It said, F you. Uh, I said, Jesus is king of kings, F him too. I mean, it was just foul. And it wasn't the kind of language this young lady used. And I just sat there staring in unbelief. I mean, I just thought, what what has happened to my friend? And uh, I called a couple of other pastors from our church and from a daughter church we'd started and then elders. And we ended up with about 12 people in my front room. And one of our elders was a re- retired missionary from Brazil. And he said, oh, there's no problem. I can show you how to work with this. And I thought, well, great. And he leaned over and he said something like, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, you foul spirit, leave this. And it, she looked up and I, I recognized by now it wasn't her. Uh, it was just wasn't her. And it just wow. said, you can get after you F and this and that. You don't know what you're doing. None of you know what you're doing. This is fun. And then there would just be this kind of cackling laughter. And uh, some of the guys would uh, sing. It was like, you can sing all you want. We're not going anywhere. I mean, that's why I said it just, I didn't go looking for this, brothers. And I just sat there and I just said, either I can challenge my paradigm that I was taught, which is man-made, or I can continue to ignore scripture that certainly seems to indicate, and I, I give lots of verses in that in that uh, book, where, where believers and unbelievers, I mean, seem to be involved with demons. It doesn't seem that they... Uh, if you're a believer, they can't be involved with you. That's a nice cliche. You just can't even support that biblically. Right. But, uh, so I, I just looked at this situation and thought, I have got to find out what's going on. And maybe that's part of the apologist in me. I, I don't like losing. So we we brought some people in, and the girl's father flew in, a, that, a missionary. Uh, he'd been in ministry six. He was, a, he was at White Rock, B.C., named George Birch. His wife's name was Grace I grew to really love both of them, and uh, he just said, I worked for 30 years overseas with this, and then I've worked with it in, in uh, you know, Canada, the United States, and he said, what do they teach you guys in your school about spiritual warfare? I said, to make fun of it, to mock it. It's just for weak people. It's for people that have their very big on feelings but very short on Scripture, and, uh, and you know, they want to blame everything on the devil, and he said, son, you need an education, and he said, mm-hmm. I'm going to give you an education. He basically gave to me an education from his 30 years pastoring there in White Rock, B.C., and his 30 years overseas as a missionary. He was very old when I met him, but he was sharp, and he did what he said he would do. He said, I'm going to give you an education on what this is about. Remember he said one time to me when we started, he said, he said North Americans you know, are taught that there's some kind of hand around North America because of their sophistication and commitment to empiricism, that demons can't touch them. And he said, idolatry is idolatry. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, where well, I worked, he was in mainland China till 48 when, when Mao kicked him out in 48. He and his wife worked with Ruth Graham Bell's parents. They were all in the same area. Hmm. And uh, 48, Mao kicked him out. He went to Indonesia and worked 18 more years there. And then he... Then he went back to BC and, and pastored there. But he said, uh, I, I work with people that bow down to the to the and give libations to gods of fertility and gods of the harvest and all that. And we say they're idolaters. And he said, I come back to the States and he goes, I've got people that bow down to their car, they bow down to their house, they bow down to their titles. He said, Idolatry is idolatry. He said it's just far more sophisticated in North America, but he said it's still moving Christ to the back and putting other things in front of Christ as an idol. And uh, I said, well, you hooked me. Teach me. And so uh, that was kind of, it didn't start with as a, as a curiosity. Uh, it started kind of as a mind-blowing uh, situation in my front room that I have said I believe God orchestrated. Uh, I was young. You know, in my 20s, and I think he was saying, "Uh, little boy, I'm going to teach you some things that you need to understand. And if you're obedient to me, you can pass it off to somebody else before I either take you home or call you up. You know, if if I come, whichever happens first, either I die to go be with him or or he calls me up and I meet him in the air. I've got a job, whether it's the discipleship training or it's the spiritual warfare stuff, guys, I've got a job to give away what I've been given 
so others can say, man, if you can work with that, I can work with that. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I didn't want it to be a circus. How about that? Mm -hmm. I say that in the book. Too much of what I read. I'm not saying all. There's some very – Fred Dickinson is as good as they get working with this. Mark Bubeck was as good as they get. Uh, Bubeck's dead. Dickinson's still alive in the Chicago area. Marcus Warner, Dean Vandermay from Set Free Ministries. There's some really guys that are good with this. They've written some good stuff, but there's a lot of junk. Too much of the stuff that I either see on TV, I won't even watch it anymore. In the yeah. books, uh, it, it's, it turns things into a circus. And I've said turning things into a circus just glorifies the, the other side. You've been delegated authority that's greater than the authority of a demon because our master, the Lord Jesus, is creator. Their master is just part of the creation. And when you allow things to go into a circus, you're giving them more credit than they should. They, they deserve to have. And and yeah. when I see the ones that, whether they're purposely trying to point attention to themselves or if they just don't know what they're doing, uh, they don't know. You don't have to turn it into a circus. Mm-hmm. Circuses scare people. Circuses have people who are not sure what they think go, oh, man, that is weird. And if that's what this is about, I'm not looking into that. That's just goofy. Mm-hmm. And, and I've said it's about delegated authority. Your authority is greater than theirs. That's the end of the argument. That's, that's the basis for knowing I win, they lose because Christ won. Amen. Well, you mentioned, you know, your, your book there. In, in the book, you actually explain the model that is typically used to explain demonic activity is kind of a twofold one that consists of oppression and possession. However, you suggest a threefold model that adds demonization. Can you talk about why you believe it necessary to make that change? Yeah, because the first paradigm, that's where I open with that book. You know, what is sacrosanct, scripture or a man-made paradigm? I think that's a huge question. And the, the traditional, you know, the one I was trained with at Bible school and seminary and still here, although not as often. Uh, Hmm. That side's backed up a little bit, but uh, a a few corners it hasn't. But in a lot of places, it's like something's going on. We just don't understand it. But basically it was either you're dealing with oppression, which means it's an annoyance, but it's not really a big deal. All you have to do again is memorize scripture. Uh, You know, you'll be just fine. Or possession, and they would say that means that you're owned by the devil, and then they love to go to... 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18, which contextually has nothing to do with this argument, nothing. That's why I spend some time working on that verse. Uh, You know, if you're owned by the devil, then clearly you're not owned by God, so you're not a Christian. So either it's Christians having to deal with a simple thing, which just basically stand on who you are in Christ and walk on and don't worry about it, or you don't belong to Christ and and you've opened up, you know, yourself to demonic influence in a way that uh, you're, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're being controlled, and, and you're no longer in control. And uh, I, again, I assumed that was true until, again, I, I still don't doubt the salvation of this young lady. And, and I can tell you, I don't use names, I've worked with more pastors and missionaries than you would ever guess. I've had pastors fly in who are pastors of mega churches coming in. I've got their books in my library. And yet hmm. they'll say, I know I'm saved. I mean, I've got a very effective ministry, but there's something really wrong. Yeah. Uh, I've had missionaries fly in from out of the country, not not just, you know, local, and say, I love Jesus, but something is very wrong. And so this whole notion about, well, if you're a Christian, the only thing it can be is is just this, you know, annoying little, little, little uh, occasional arrow that flies at you, which rarely gets explained. What is the flaming arrow? Well, it's something. The Bible says in 616 of Ephesians, they happen. So, but it's just not a big deal. Or you've just lost your mind. You know, you're the gathering demoniac, and you howl at the moon, and, and uh, you know, you sleep buck naked, and you hurt people. And I don't see many people like that in my church, so I don't think I have to worry about that. I looked at the Word. Uh, the the first one to really challenge me to do that was, was uh, Fred Dickinson. Fred was, uh, people don't know, he was taught at Moody in the theology department for 34 years. He was the head of the department for 26 years, and he's written a number of very good books on this subject. But uh, he, he, he said, look at the etymology of demonizomenos, which is the participle that's used 12 times. Uh, demonizomai is the verb. But you see, the participle regularly was used in the New Testament. And the word meant this demon caused passivity. And you see it used of both believers and unbelievers. In Ephesians chapter 4, this one, and again, the people that want to want to make fun of all of this from our side. I mean, they're brothers, sisters in Christ. I love them. I just think they're as wrong as they think I'm wrong. 
but at least I think I've got scripture to stand on instead of cliches. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, Paul basically is saying, don't play games with sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. I have said you could say, don't let it go down on your immorality. Don't go let it go down on your fear. Don't let it go down on your bitterness. The whole idea was deal with your sin. Verse 26, chapter 4 of Ephesians. Why? 27. You do not want to give. The word was topos. That's a military term. It was used literally. There's not one example of it being used other than literally in the New Testament. And it meant to give away a place, a space, or a territory of control to an enemy. That's what the word meant. Paul knew that when he used that. It's like you and an enemy are fighting for a piece of property, and he wins, so he throws you off the property. He says, I stand on this ground until someone strong enough tosses me off of it. Ephesians 4 is clearly written to believers. Anyone trying to say contextually, Paul all of a sudden flips the, flips the script to start talking about, well, I'm just talking to non-Christians. He's addressing believers, telling them in 26, don't play with your sin. Deal with your sin. Don't let the sun go down on it. He wouldn't be telling non-Christians that. He'd be telling them they need the gospel. They need mm-hmm. to get, you know, they become Christians. Then he says, why? You do not want to give topos to the devil. You do not want to give a place, a space, or a territory of control to the devil. And I have said, if Christians can't be touched by demons, there's absolutely no reason for Paul to have told the Christians, you need to wake up and smarten up. Don't play games with sin. Because you don't want to give away, English translations usually say opportunity, handhold, foothold, something like that. Again, the word meant just to give away a place or space or territory of control. And I've said... I don't see that verse being worked with very often by people who want to deny this whole thing. They kind of conveniently step over it. And why? Because it's very clear it's addressed to believers. And it's very clear that he says that the problem becomes indebted to having ground held against you or territory held against you from the demonic, from the devil. So, you know, it it goes against the narrative if you're wanting to belittle all this stuff. So as I started looking at that, and I can give you more verses if you want. Again, there's plenty in the book. I started going, I think we've missed. I think oppression is basically an annoyance. I think we all deal with the fiery arrows. You're fat. You're ugly. No one likes you. Uh, Why do you pray? No one's listening. Why do you read your Bible? You don't get anything out of it. You know, just people think you're a fool for loving Jesus. I think all believers that are very active in their faith catch those arrows once in a while. But I don't think they're debilitating and just put them down on the ground. I think there are people where you would say, are they just seem to be totally captivated? It's like they're just out of their mind. I've been in work. I, I mean, in, <laughs> I remember when I was in Spokane, they called it 8 North. I don't know if it's still there or not. I've been gone from there a long time. But, you know, I would walk in to talk to somebody. I'd be asked if I would talk to somebody, and and uh, clearly they're just not there. And, again, I'm not saying everybody at 8 North that that place is still working isn't there. I'm just saying it's a psych ward, right? But I see people in between where they love the Lord. Uh, they walk with Jesus. They do memorize Scripture. They do read their Bible. They pray regularly, and they're constantly getting these mental darts, and they're debilitating. And then when someone like me would share some sage wisdom, like, well, either you're making this up or you're not a Christian, uh, you know, or you need to check yourself into a psych ward, all that does in their mind is, see, now he doesn't even believe me, and he thinks I'm making this up. And they feel like they're Christians, but they're on the outside looking in. And then they're constantly hearing in their head things like, and I've said people tell me I hear voices, I get thoughts, I get ideas, I get these mental impressions. I said, you can call them whatever you want. They're mental and they land. And it's like, why do you go to church? They don't believe you. Uh, you know, Why do you follow Jesus? He doesn't help you. If he loved you, why would he let you go through this? It's because you're not really a Christian. You know, you'd be better off dead. Doesn't the Bible say that uh, there's no greater love you have than to lay your life down for your friend? Well, see, so many people stumble over your horrible testimony of being a Christian that if you would kill yourself, your friends would think that was selfish, but God would know you did that so other people would no longer stumble over your bad testimony and you would actually be helping people go to heaven. And I have had Christians tell me what they hear in their head is I would be virtuous to kill myself because I'm worthless and no good and it's never going to change and God would like that. I, I, that's certainly not coming from the Holy Spirit. But for people to say that kind of thing can't come from someone who's born again, I'll say, you better wake up. You better wake up. I'll give you a quick story. See if this helps. 
I would say recently, but it can't be too recently because we closed our office in March of 20 with the COVID. And uh, we're, we're open now again, but I've been back in my office now for about two weeks. Some of them came back, but I had a hip replacement and that knocked it out a while. But we've been well over a year that our office was closed down. And this happened while we were still open. So I think it was sometime in 20 or maybe it was the end of 19. But I had a uh, one of the special forces. You know, we've got military bases up here, right? Lots of Navy. Uh, but there's probably other groups too. But uh, uh, at any rate, I had a guy get a hold of me and he said, can I talk with you? Could I come in? Would you clear some time? And I said, what's up? And he said, well, I'm Captain so-and-so and and, and uh, I lead a special forces group and I attempted to kill myself. I've been a Christian for 17 years. I'm on my way up to uh, to Bainbridge for, uh, or Bremerton, not Bainbridge, it's Bremerton. I'm on my way up for a psych evaluation. I'm going to be an in, inpatient for a week, you know, to see what's going on. And uh, he said, you know, I've had these things talking to me, and someone told me about you. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll clear the time. And I did. I thought, heck, a serviceman like that. So at any rate, he comes in, and I, I just said, if I was in your head, what would I hear? And he said, oh, it started two years ago, and it doesn't turn off. You know, you're a loser. Uh, you're not a Christian. You never were a Christian. Or if you were a Christian, God's so disappointed in you, he left you. It's never going to change. Your men don't respect you. You don't deserve the rank you have or the, the authority that you have. Uh, you're a fraud, and, and, and you know it, and, and uh, you'd be better off dead. And I said, let me guess. I said, you heard it. It bothered you so much that you quit sleeping. And he thought, man, are you psychic? And I said, no, I've just heard it a lot of times. He said it interfered with my sleep. And then after I was sleeping, I said things that weren't reasonable started sounding halfway as reasonable because you're rummy dummy. He said, that's exactly what happened. And then he said, I started drinking. I he wasn't a drinker before. He said, I just tried to quiet the voice. And he said, as, as I drank, then I would hear all the more. See, you really couldn't be a Christian because what kind of a Christian would get drunk? You would turn to God and he would take care of you It's because he doesn't love you, blah, blah, blah. I said, that's why you attempted to kill yourself. He said, yeah, I just finally thought maybe it's right. Maybe I'm just a loser and maybe the best thing I can do is get out of the way so other people. I said, how long have you been a Christian? 17 years. You verbal about your faith? Very. And he said to me, Carl, that's really hard in the military. A lot of people aren't. He said, I'm a captain, special friend. I'm very open about my faith. And uh, and he said, what am I doing wrong? And I said, maybe that's the wrong question. And, and he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, I, I, and I don't remember verbatim the exact, you know, but I'm telling you the gist of what was said. I said, I said, Captain, how much time do you spend preparing for people on your missions that can't hurt you? And he looked at me and he said, well, why would we prepare, prepare for people that can't hurt us? We've got to prepare for the people that can hurt us. I said, yeah. I said, so if someone can't hurt you, do you spend time worrying about them, preparing for them? He said, absolutely not. And I said, you know, you have asked me four or five times, what am I doing wrong? He said, I'm even confessing sin that I don't know if I've confessed it. I don't even know if I've done it. I'm just saying, God, if I've got hidden sin, gosh, please make this stop. And he said, I just feel all the time like I'm in this hole. And, and I said, I think demons are pretty smart. And my guess would be that they probably save their best ammo and their best games for the people they think can hurt them. And if a person can't hurt them, why wake them up? Just say, dream on, whether that's a Christian or a non-Christian. You're not hurting anybody. I said to him, I said, it's like you're on an inner tube out in the ocean and just paddling around. The only one you're going to see are a sea turtle once in a while or a seagull. I mean, you're not bothering anybody with the gospel of Christ. And, and I said, but for someone who's in the game, I said, you said you're verbal about your faith. He said, I have been. I said, I would want to shut you up. I would see you as a very viable opponent. And he rocked back in his chair and he said, I've been asking the wrong question. He said, I bought the lie that there's something wrong with me. And so now I'm looking for more and more things I'm doing wrong. And he said, the truth is, if I was as worthless as these thoughts tell me, no one would worry about me because I'm already out of the game anyway. Hmm. I said, I, that makes sense to me. And he says, well, as a soldier, that makes sense to me, too. Uh, what's the point? I, I see too many times where where Christians buy the lie, and then the assumption is either, well, I'm no longer relevant to God because if I am saved, he's not going to use me, or maybe I was never saved in the first place, and I'm surely not going to open my mouth up about Jesus Christ because I would feel like such a hypocrite anyway. So I've said, demons, first plan is to keep you from meeting Christ. How do I interfere with that process? Their second plan is, their plan B, if I can't keep you out of heaven, how do I keep you convinced you can't help anybody else get there? 
So I constantly remind you of your shortcomings to where you feel like, how can I share anything? I would feel like such a fool, such a hypocrite. And they go, bingo. I couldn't keep you out of heaven, but I shut your mouth. I shut down your, your work. Why would demons mess with people who aren't involved in the work? Hmm. I mean, they might. I'm not saying they can't, but I'm saying their target is going to be the one who wants to walk with God. That's the enemy. You know, spe- thinking of, that's very helpful, by the way. Think Speaking of the kind of the opponents of the Christian, I, I really found it helpful in your book how you explain that the opponents of the Christian, you, you explain it like a pie that has three pieces, and, and the pie is made up of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Can you explain the difference between these? Because I can I can easily imagine a Christian hearing that and thinking, well, I kind of thought they just made up the same kind of thing, you know? Oh, that's but, such but, a great I, question. but I think the distinction for me was just so helpful, so eye opening. So, again, if you could just kind of briefly explain the difference between each. I'd love to, Chad. Um, when you say spiritual warfare, most people automatically, you know, pivot to, well, he's talking about demonic warfare. And I would say demonic warfare is part of spiritual warfare, but we're told that the world, you know, in first John chapter two, verses 15 to 17, if, if you love this world, the love of the father isn't in you and mm-hmm. all that's in the world, the less the flesh, the less the eye, the boastful pride of life. These things aren't from the father. Uh, James four, four. You know, the one who loves this world is an adulterer. You know, it's, that's strong language. I've said, yeah. does the Bible identify the world as a problem for a believer? Yes, it does. Unique about the world. Uh, and, and here, I'm, I'm going to try and help with this question, see if this makes sense. I have said the solicitation from the world is always external. Always. Hmm. Lust of the eye, boastful pride of life, lust of the flesh. How does that work? Well, I see a billboard, I hear music, I laugh. I grew up on Motown. I'm still a a Motown guy. I don't have the oldies on my radio station, on my car. I used to have it on it, and I'd always start driving too fast because I'd hear the music, and I'm back in high school or junior (laughs) high, whatever. I'd look down, and my wife would say, honey, you're driving too fast. So I just took it off my radio. That wasn't something internal. That was something that that external music started reminding me of when I was young and stupid, and all of a sudden I'm driving too fast. Or or I'm driving down the highway, Sacramento was hot, the San Joaquin Valley and all, and I used to drive Seattle to Sacramento or Spokane to Sacramento a lot. A lot of hot, hot territory in the summer. I'm not thinking about being thirsty, and I one of the billboards says Richie's Diner, Coca-Cola. And I think, man, I'm thirsty. I'm, I'm going to pull in in a mile and get a Coca-Cola. I was solicited externally by something that I wasn't even thinking about. It happened to be physiological, right? It happened to be thirst. Uh, If it was an ice cream cone, now I'm hungry. I want to have a Baskin Robbins. I wasn't thinking about it until I saw, I heard the music. In other words, it was triggered externally. Verse 17, John says, the way I successfully deal with solicitation from the world is to evaluate the solicitation and remember something. The things of this world fade away. The things of God abide forever. He doesn't say the things of this world can't be beautiful. He just says they're temporary and they're not worth it. Do I get solicited through a world system? Yes. Great question I got from an eight-year-old. I I, I shared this, I think, in the book. An eight-year-old. Remember, I've taught graduate seminary students. I've taught undergraduate. I've never had one ask me this question. He says that, uh, he said, Dad, I know that the world is bad and I'm not supposed to love it. I said, yep, that's what it says, son. But John says in chapter 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So he says, John says the world is good in the gospel of John, but the world is bad in 1 John. And he looks at me and says, so is the world good or bad? And I just thought, that's a heck of a question. Uh, (laughs) And so what I said to him was, it's the word cosmos, it's used a number of different ways you know, contextually, but there's three primary. It's used uh, as in John 3 as a synonym for people. God died for people. Uh, it's used in Acts 17, 24, uh, explaining, I make the twinkly things, the, the heaven, the earth, the sea, all that lie therein. I'm a creator of, of the natural order. But it's used in James, and it's used in other places too, but First John, the one I, I think is particularly clear, 
of a system that's in organized rebellion against God. So what you need to understand is contextually how is the word world being used? If it's used as a synonym for people, yes, God loves people. If it's used of the creation, that's just a statement of fact. He's creator. If it's used of an organized system in rebellion against God, then you can't love this world and love God at the same time because they're going diametrically opposed in your loyalties. And I said, so first John is talking about people who have sold out to the solicitation to a system, a culture, a worldview that is in rebellion against God. How does it tell me to deal with that? Verse 17, remember, evaluate, the things of this world fade away. They may be pretty. They're just not worth it. When I deal with the flesh, that's chapter, that's four is the world in that book. Five is the flesh, six is the demonic. I, I gave each one of them a chapter because I'm trying to send a message that says all three of them can kick you behind. Mm-hmm. All three yeah. of them can derail you as a Christian. Right. Can you be derailed by falling in love with the things of this world and yeah, selling out? Yes, you can can mitigate against your testimony. How about the flesh? Now, when I first did this, I had someone say, well, it says that part of the world system is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the boastful pride of life. And now what, what I had suggested earlier, I give this as a seminar, I'll say, think of a circle, divide it in three pieces, think of it like a pie, right? One piece of the pie is the world, one piece is the flesh, one piece is the devil. What I have said is I use two verses for each piece of the pie, Purposely, I ask a group, I was teaching this, you know, within the last six weeks, why do I use two verses for each one? And they looked at me and said, I'm not sure. I said, because I want to send a message. They're all equal opportunity opponents. Mm. I said, if I put down 17 verses on struggles with the flesh and one verse for demonic attack, what's your assumption? Well, you think the flesh is really a big problem and the demonic stuff can be ignored. So I said, I go two, two, and two in that lesson when I teach it. The two I use for the uh, the world, I already told you, James 4, 4, 1 John 2, 15 to 17. For the flesh, I use Romans 7, 15 to 25 and Galatians 5, 17. Why? Paul is a believer talking to believers, says, I, the one wanting to do good. Well, they already told us in chapter 3 that unbelievers don't seek God, they don't want to do good. He told us in 1 Corinthians 2.14 that the things of God are foolish to the natural man. And yet he says here, I, the one wanting to do God, I'm wanting to serve God. I, I The things I don't want to do, sometimes I do. The things I do want to do, I don't. What in the world is going on? And I've said he identifies it as the flesh or the old man. In Galatians 5.17, I think it's just a cliff version's note of the same verse. He says, Verse 16, important. Walk controlled by the Spirit. You will not carry out the strong desires of the flesh. Clearly talking to who? Believers or unbelievers? Clearly talking to believers. When you walk controlled by the Spirit, you will not carry out the strong desires of the flesh. 17, but the flesh wars against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh within you, that you may not do the things you choose to do. I've said 17 tells me there's a battle going on as a believer with what he identifies again as the flesh. Well, what's the flesh? 19 through 21. Here's evidence when you're controlled as a believer by the flesh. 22 and 23, here's evidence of what happens when you're controlled by the Spirit. My point is, he's talking to believers, there's a war going on and it's inside. What's that have to do with your question? The solicitation from the world is external. The solicitation from the flesh is internal. Uh, I, I, I don't know who you cater to with your, with your thing, so I don't know if I'm I, I, today, I don't even know how you can shock people. The standards are gone. Common sense is gone. But I've, I've said this in conference. I've said I do not have to be staring at a billboard of a naked woman to imagine a naked woman in my mind and undress her. I, right. I, don't, I can't blame that on a billboard. I'm perfectly capable of doing that. And that didn't come from outside from something I saw. That came from inside. So I'll say the flesh is part of... One of the gates for the world, lust the flesh, lust the eye, both will pride of life. But it's external. When it's the second piece of the pie, the struggle with the flesh proper, the orientation of the solicitation is different. It's coming from inside now instead of coming from outside. When I'm talking about the demonic, I have suggested, and oh, and again, I use two verses there again. Uh, again, I, I just try to, you know, I, I use, uh, typically I, I use, um, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, you know, we're shot at with fiery arrows, or Revelation 12, 10, 11, 
where John says that the accuser accuses us 24-7 before the throne of God. And I have said, I think accusations and arrows are the same thing. I think it's just two different apostles explained in a different way. But what I have suggested is the solicitation from the supernatural can be either internal or external. And so when someone says, you believe all of those are involved in spiritual warfare, I said spiritual warfare opposes a Christian from being able to grow and to serve. Does that happen through attacks from the world? Yes. From the flesh? Yes. From the demonic? Yes. So I include all three of them. When I'm talking to charismatic groups, they usually want me to focus on the demonic. When I'm talking to non-charismatic groups, they usually want me to focus on the flesh. My comment has been, if you get really good at recognizing and responding to one of them, but you don't know how to respond to the other two, you're still going to lose more battles than you win. Yeah, that that was very. I'm sorry to interrupt, but that was that you make that you make that point in the book the 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 importance of you know being able to recognize each and how you combat each uniquely, and that was that was eye opening to me, something I had never seen. Yeah. Um, yeah, see, the, the compartmentalizing, well, we'll deal with one or the other. I don't think it's helpful. And think about this. Let me, let me wrap this up this way. I am told my response, biblical response to attacks from the world is to evaluate them. Are you giving away too much for too little? My biblical response is to the flesh. 2 Timothy 2.22 says there's lusts that are too strong for you. Run from them. Mm. Okay. Ephesians chapter 4, 22 to 24 says that you put off the old man that old nature, by by the renewing of your mind. So the things you think on are the things you end up doing. So something, if it's too strong for me, and it's dealing with the flesh, I should just walk away from it. Don't play with it. Sometimes it's just a case of sloppy thinking. Learn how to renew your mind. Think on what you want to think on instead of what you don't want to think on. And then the third way that the New Testament is in in Galatians 5.16. When you learn how to walk controlled by the Holy Spirit, you will not carry out the strong desires of the flesh. So what I'm suggesting is my response to the world, evaluate it, say yes to good things, no to bad things, is not necessarily the response that I'm given biblically to the flesh when the attack is internal, representing that second piece of the pie. Run, it's too strong. Learn how to think on right things, right? You know, as a man thinks in his mind, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. So control your thinking. Or do you know what it means to be controlled by the Spirit instead of as a Christian just trying to fake this thing yourself? But then when I deal with the devil, I see a James chapter 4, demons. It says, resist the devil, he will flee from you. First Peter 5, resist the devil firmly in your faith, he will flee from you. Paul in, in, uh, in Ephesians 6, doing everything you can to stand. It's all that ante stete. It's the same basic word. I resolutely oppose the things that are demonic. I'm suggesting that when I'm told some parts of the flesh you run from because they're so strong. But when you're dealing with demons, the only thing you're ever told is to resist them firmly in your faith. Or I'm not told that if I'm struggling internally with pornography, that I should see how long I can stare at that stuff. In other words, I don't, I don't say I'm going to evaluate it as if this is coming, you know, from the world and I'm going to have my list of 10 pluses and 10 minuses and which way am I, I'm going, don't sell out cheap. The other, it's too tough, run. Or it's just a case of getting your thinking in control, that's good. Or it's learning how to walk control by the spirit, that's great. When it's demonic, again, it's one response, resist. I'm suggesting that resisting and running are very different responses. Well, if I am a Christian and I have made the whole thing a tube sock, I think that's what I said in the book. I've just told people, as long as you read your Bible and pray, you're just fine no matter who's attacking you. That is very naive because there are some attacks I need to run. There are some attacks, it's a mental thing. I just need to check my thinking. There are some things I'm being asked to sell out cheap. I need to evaluate what is this solicitation asking. And there are some attacks from the flaming arrows. I need to fight. I need to put up the shield of faith and say, I'm not a victim. If I don't know how I'm being attacked, then how do I respond? And so what you'll have is, I've seen it too many times. You'll have a Christian that says, you know, they, uh, I, my pastor told me, my teachers told me, whoever it is, my mom, my dad, my friends, that as long as I read my Bible, everything's fine. Well, if you're struggling with the flesh and, and the problem is you're not thinking correctly, then memorizing Scripture is going to be a tremendous help. But if you're getting shot at by a demon with a fiery arrow, 
Or if you're being solicited through the world to sell out to something, you can stare at your Bible all day long. That doesn't put out an arrow. Hmm. So I need to learn how to recognize where the attacks are coming from so I know how to empower or employ the right response. And if I just make that thing the tube sock, that doesn't matter. I'm a Christian, so who cares? I'll just say you can do that, but you're going to lose more than you win. And at some point, if the demonic attack kicks in, you start going to hear stuff like, I thought Christians were supposed to redeem the time. You waste the time. I thought Christians were supposed to win in their battles. You lose the battles all the time. See, you're not really a Christian. If you were really a Christian, well, if God really loved you, why would he let you go through what you've had to go through? It's because he doesn't really love you. He's not good. If he was good, he would be watching out for you. Again, why do you read your Bible? You never get anything out of it. All you do is waste time. You stare at the Bible. In other words, once that mental stuff kicks in because the battle shifts from either the world or the flesh, maybe that's where it starts, to where they're getting just antagonized by these thoughts. I can either say, I'm making all of this up, or I can say, but what if it's true? I thought about 2 Corinthians 11. I'll give you guys a second verse that gets skipped, usually by the people that want to skip this stuff. 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4, very interesting. Paul says, put up with me, I'm your dad. He already told us in 1 Corinthians you know, 4 and 5 that he's the, he's the, he was the daddy of the, of the Christians at Corinth. So put up with me, I'm your dad. You were walking. I'm, I'm the one who entered, I betrothed you to Christ. So is he talking to believers in 2 Corinthians 11? Yes. Right. He's saying, I'm the one who led you to Christ. He says, you were walking in purity in your devotion to Christ. So if someone wants to say, oh, they're just Corinthians and they were flakes because the Christians in you know, 1 Corinthians, First Corinthians chapters one through fifteen are not not a Hall of Fame chapter for chapters for believers. A lot mm. of problems. But in Second Corinthians, he said they'd responded better, you know. But he says, I, "I got this issue with you. Help me understand it. I'm your dad. I introduced you to Christ. You're walking in purity in your devotion, and yet now you're talking about a Jesus that I didn't teach you. You're now receiving spirits other than the one you had received, and you're preaching a gospel other than the one." that I taught you, and then it's idiomatic and five, and, and you don't fight. I mean, you're, you're passive about the whole thing. I don't get it. What are you doing? They essentially say to him, well, they said they were apostles. They said they were teachers like you, so we listen to him. 13 through 15, he says, when Satan, their boss, parades himself as an angel of light, why does it surprise you that his emissaries would tell you that they're teachers of the gospel, they're teaching the truth, you know, they're apostles, etc.? What is going on? Clearly, people who had been walking with God, believers. So the whole notion about, uh, and, and the one that caught my interest, a different Jesus, but involved with spirit other than the one you had received. According to 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen, when I become a Christian, I am baptized by the spirit into the body of Christ. We are all made to partake of that same, same spirit. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14, very clear that when I believed, I was baptized by the Spirit who is a guarantee of my salvation. So I received the Spirit of God when I believe, says Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Romans 8, 9, if you do not have the Spirit, you do not belong to Christ. So if someone doesn't have the, if they don't belong to Christ, they don't have the Spirit. He's saying, put up with me, I'm concerned for you. Why? Least as the serpent deceived Eve in her mind. That is what the text says. You are being deceived. How so? You've got a different Jesus than I taught. You're now involved with spirits other than the one you had received. Well, as believers, they had received the Holy Spirit, so what are they now involved with? And it's got so bad, you're promoting a gospel other than the one we preached, and you don't even seem to fight it. Except with excuses. Well, they said they were apostles and telling the truth. Well, the boss says he's an angel of light. I mean, he lies. Why don't you think they would too? But, Mike, I look at that and I go, where was the battle focused in the mind? Hmm. Just as they de- as, as a serpent deceived Eve in her mind, you are being deceived. But he's talking to believers. How bad did it get? Preaching a different Jesus involved with spirits other than the one they had received and a different gospel. I have friends who would say, well, then they clearly weren't saved. Because if they're a Christian, they couldn't get involved with other spirits. And if they're Christians, they wouldn't teach a wrong Jesus, and they wouldn't teach a a wrong gospel. And yet he says, I'm the one that betrothed you to Christ, and you are walking in purity in your devotion to Christ. So that's why I'm saying you can either stick to your paradigm, it's man-made, or you can say maybe there's something going on that was missed, and maybe there really is oppression, 
Maybe there really is possession, not ownership. just means that the degree of control is very strong. Uh, there's only one creator. He's the one that owns everything. The rest of it just represents part of the creation, not owners, renters. But maybe there's that group in the middle that they could say, it's not so simple. The control is not so simple that I can just blow it off like the oppression, but it's not where I have no ability to think or function. I'm a Christian. I still love God, but I keep getting drugged back into this and it's a mental kind of war. And I usually end up losing it to the point. I'm feeling like I'm embarrassed to talk much about Jesus because I would look so hypocritical. That's why I said, how about we shift the paradigm that would be more consistent with all of scripture instead of just parts of scripture. And it would include people who the other paradigm excludes. Because instead of saying they're not Christians or they're crazy, it's saying you may be a Christian, but you feel like on the outside looking in because you don't know how to deal with something you don't recognize. So don't throw up your hands. Don't put a bullet through your head. Don't put drugs down your body. Let's learn how to recognize it so we can respond in a biblical fashion. And then when you win, which you will, then you can take that Second Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 and the comfort God gave you. You, in turn, can share that comfort with others when they feel like, well, no one understands what I'm going through. I'm the only one that lays in my bed at night and thinks you're not really a Christian. And if I tell someone, they think I'm crazy, so I'm not going to tell them, but I know that's what's going through my mind, etc., etc., etc. Now, instead, when someone else says, you would never believe me, I say, try me. Maybe I won't believe you. I don't know. I don't know what you're going to say. But why don't you tell me what's going on in your head? And when they start repeating the same kind of things, that you've, you've never heard that before, have you? I'm the only one. I must be. I go, no, actually, I've heard hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people share your story. Well, well is there a way through this? Oh, yeah. Does the Bible wow. say that? Oh, yeah. You just have to learn how to recognize and respond to all three enemies instead of considering yourself an expert on one and ignoring the other two. Yeah, and and just for listeners, um, the book is excellent for many reasons, but that that piece alone is is worth the price of the book. <laughs> yeah, in the book you talk about how uh, people can sort of open the door to demonic influence or demonization, and you talk about how they give ground through sin that uh, is unrepented of, things like that. And you talk about telling the difference between what is demonization and what might be like just, oh, this is just anxiety or depression or some sort of emotional trouble. And one of the phrases you use, and you sort of sprinkled it in there a little bit, uh, habitual debilitating or paralyzing accusation, habitual debilitating or paralyzing accusation. I I thought that was a really good descriptor of this. And so in seeing that doors can be opened, ground can be given through sin and through not, you know, resisting certain things. And then you've got this sort of habitual debilitating or paralyzing accusation. Now there's got to, maybe your listeners are like, well, how do we get rid of this stuff? How do we get this out? And you've talked about a few moments ago, it's an issue of authority and resisting. Can you walk us a little bit through what that process looks like to whatever detail or extent you feel comfortable with? First, on the, on the arrows, the difference, I, I get it. I have lots of Christian counselors now that come see me or they come to conferences and say, I, I can deal with physiological things. I can deal with mental things, but there's another area where it's real, but we just don't seem to touch it sometimes. And maybe this is what's going on. Then here's the question. How do you tell the difference between mental illness and demonization? Uh, that's usually the way I get it. And I'll say, well, it's an imperfect science, but I'll give you something that, that has been helpful for me. And it ties back to the arrows. When a person says, I occasionally get this arrow, this goofy thought, uh, you know, it really bothers me, but you know, I either ignore it. I walk on, I pray and it stops. You know, I I just walk on. I'll go, I'm inclined to say that more represents just the occasional arrow. When someone is saying to me, Carl, I get hit with so many arrows that I can't raise my shield fast enough, high enough, low enough. I I mean, if I raise my shield high, I get hit low. If I put my shield low, I get high. If I put it in front of my chest, I get hit in my back. If I put it over my shoulder, I get hit in my chest. It's like someone talks about occasionally catching an arrow. They don't turn off for me. I I mean, I just, it's, it's, it's kind of like where John talks about 24 seven in revelation 12, we're accused by the devil Mm -hmm. before God. I feel like, I don't know if it's Satan doing it or one of his helpers, 
But, Carl, I'm not dealing with an occasional arrow that is you just blow it off. I'm dealing with something that feels like it's so compelling and so disturbing that it just shuts me down. And so when someone says to me, the focus is habitual, and I'll give you one more thought, Brian. When the focus of that has to do something with Jesus, his adequacy, your adequacy. When I have worked with people that are just truly psychotic, they are all over the board. When I'm dealing with Christians who are demonized, it goes back to either you don't love God with enough sincerity, you don't pray with enough repentance, he doesn't love you if he ever did, your prayers bounce off the ceiling, Jesus is not who he claimed to be. In other words, it, ha- it points back to either Jesus' adequacy to save me or my adequacy in following him. That about 999 times out of a 1,000 is where those arrows are focused for believers. When I'm dealing with somebody, they're just psychotic. It's like, you know, I, I go in one day and I meet a guy and he, same, he introduces himself to him. He's a Catholic priest. No, he's not. I come in the next day to see him and he tells me he's the Apostle Peter. I say, okay. I see him the next day and he's somebody else. I mean, it's just all over. I don't know who I'm going to see when I go in. But when it's the demonization, it is usually just so focused on you don't measure up or Jesus doesn't measure up, so give up. I I wanted to add a quick follow-up question there. Most of what we're talking about is um, the what's going on in someone's mind, the thoughts and the accusation and uh, beating you down mentally. How does that tie into sin? Is it something, would it be something that causes someone to be caught in a sin? Is that similar to that? Or is the sin the cause or they kind of work in tandem? I'm just trying to put my mind around that part. Great question. Let me give you an example and see if you can answer it. Answer the question. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ was perfect. Yeah. Never, Never sinned. I'm told in Matthew 4 that the devil solicited him to do a number of things, including bow down and worship me. Was Jesus dirty because he was involved in a solicitation from the devil? He would have only become dirty if he'd have done what the devil asked him to do. What was his response? He didn't say, I don't recognize you. You're not real. I'll put my hands in my ears and go, la, la, la. I'm not listening to this. He recognized the reality of the solicitation and the one doing the soliciting. But his response was, you worship God, him only. Now leave. So if somebody says the whole mental thing, Does it have to be because I am choosing to read wrong books, watch wrong movies, you know, et cetera, et cetera? And I think that demons are able to be archers and just say, hey, Chad, I think you struggle with A, B, or C. So I'm going to put an arrow and I'm going to light it up and shoot at you and see what you do. And if you put up your shield of faith and that arrow gets put out, okay, we tried, it didn't work. But if I can get you running, if I can get you looking up and down and backwards and sideways and I can get you so frustrated and going, oh my gosh, what did I do wrong? You may not have done anything wrong. That that was my point with that soldier, you know, that, that I mentioned. Mm-hmm. He's blaming himself and they're just laughing. They're just laughing at him. That why? We just wanted to shut you up as a soldier talking to all those people in the service because not very many people in the service will do that. So we found a way to shut you up. Uh, what were their lies? You're not adequate. Jesus doesn't love you. You're not a real leader, etc., etc. So I, I think what I would say is I am perfectly capable of putting myself in a position to be involved in sin, and I ought not to be blaming the devil for any of that. Mm-hmm. I am also perfectly capable of being on the receiving end of a fiery arrow, of which I did not ask for, and I did not have anything to do with it other than how am I going to respond to it. So I think that one, Brian, can go either way. Mm-hmm. Just do I learn how to recognize it and respond to it? Yeah. In the in the book, you talk about how you might have an interview with someone and talk to them about their struggles, talk to them about areas that they've had addictive uh, sins where that are maybe areas of addiction for them, and kind of get a feel for areas of struggle to identify, you know, what needs to be confronted. Can you talk a little bit about how you see that process and how you just go about that? Yeah. First, I listen a lot. That interview is for me to try and figure out, do I think I've got someone that's got a vivid imagination? Uh, have they been reading scary books and then saying I have a hard time sleeping? Uh, you know, what? Yeah. What's, what's going on? At some point in my mind, I will 
uh, make an evaluation that either I think, yeah, this one certainly looks like it could be the real thing, or I don't think so. And I've had many a person that's come to my office and said, you know what, I've heard you know how to work with this. Here's what's going on. And I've said, I, I don't think you're dealing with demons. You may be dealing with the world, the flesh. You may be dealing with imagination. But And I will say, let's learn how to uh, deal with right thinking. Uh, I, I tell them a story about elephants and bears. Uh, I'll, mm. I'll tell them, yeah, you like, I, I love that. Jay yes. Carter gave that to me. You know, you're always thinking about pink elephants, and every time I think of a pink elephant, I think about what a bad temper I have, and why won't that pink elephant go away? I won't think about pink elephants. I won't think about pink elephants. I've said, all you do is reinforce whatever that pink elephant's reminding you of. And in the case of the example I gave, you have a, a violent temper. You know, you, you don't control your temper. I said, how about you start thinking about polar bears? Uh, you know, James 1. You know, be quick to hear and slow to speak. The anger of man will not accomplish the righteousness of God. How about thinking on what you want to think on instead of beating yourself up for what you don't want to think on? So if I don't think it's coming from demons, I'll, I'll walk them through an exercise like that and say, let's just start practicing. If I think that what they're dealing with is an occasional arrow, I'll say, let's deal with offensive prayer, which has been a very, very helpful for many, many people learning how to pray offensively instead of just defensively. And if you want to follow up on that, another question we can, or another time, sometime maybe we'll get back together again. But if I think it's the real thing, I will first give them an assignment. And what I will tell them is, I want you to take three verses that I'm going to give you. I use the same ones, Colossians 3, 5 through 8, Mark 7, 21 to 23, and Galatians 5, 19 through 21. And I'll say, I want you to write down for me anything from any of these three lists that represents an ongoing habitual battle. If it happens occasionally, I don't want you to mess with it. Demons are not polite enough to occasionally bother you. When they're involved, they dogpile and they tell you over and over you're worthless and you'd be better off dead, blah, 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 right? So uh, if, if you have to, I, I had a dad come in and say, I have a demon of anger. And I said, why? Do you think that? He said, uh, I yelled at my son. That's a true story, right? He said, well, I try not to tell untrue stories, but he, he just, <laughs> he was, he was, he was so concerned. And I said, what happened? He said, he said, my boy slammed the car door on my hand and I yelled at him and it just crushed him. He started crying. And I said, when did that happen? And he said about Christmas, you know, Christmas, December ish. And I said, I'd have yelled at my son if he slammed my hand in the car door. And he said, well, now it's, it's summer. He had come to see me in the summer. And he said, I still see those eyes in my head of my son crying. And he said, I just can't believe I yelled at him like that. I should have found a different way to deal with that. He said, so I'm thinking maybe I have a demon of anger. And I said, is your wife afraid of you? No. Is your, are your children afraid of you? No. You own a business. Are your employees afraid of you? Nope. Do you have people have to walk around you on it? No. I said, you don't have a demon of anger. He said, well, how do you know that? I said, because they're not going to bother you once with your son in December and then remind you about your son in June, and you've had six months of peace in between. They're not that kind. That's not how they work. So I'm saying their role is habitual. So if it's something that represents an ongoing problem, one of the concerns I have, uh, men and women, but especially women, do I have to lay out my whole life for you? I go, I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, I'm not <laughs> asking you to do that. Uh, I said, if you tell me that immorality has been a part of your life, I had a prostitute in Spokane who came in and come to Christ. And she was bothered by the voices telling her she was still worthless, even though she come to Christ. So she circled immorality and she said, that's been my business. And she said, I can't remember all the men I had sex with. And I said, I didn't even ask you, did I? She said, well, no. I said, just write down, I've had an issue with immorality. I said, also put down, you have an issue with not telling the truth. She said, I didn't tell you that. How do you know? I said, because in all these years, I've never worked with someone involved in habitual immorality that didn't also tell lots of half-truths. You said you were here, but you were really there. You said you were doing this, but you were really doing that. And she said, oh, man, I'm really good at that. I said, that's why I said, put that down, too. Because if the one is demonic, probably the other will be, too. So I said, I don't care about particulars. And people that want a grocery list of everything, from my perspective, that's just curiosity. They don't need it. All I want to know is what are the areas that you're saying are beating you to the dirt? Uh, if it's not, don't put it down. Demons aren't that kind. But if it is, that's usually how they work. After we, after we put those things together, I will go over with them three non-negotiables. I'll say to successfully deal with demons, what I have found 
And I'll say this, and what I'm going to say next, I mean. There may be somebody else that's been working with this stuff that has different non-negotiables. If they do, and they're good at what they're doing, in other words, they've got a good track record, then listen to them. I don't pretend that what I do is the only way to work with this, or I'm the only one that works with this. I've just told you, I have, I have over the years found out that a very consistent way of people who are struggling with this stuff that say, I'm finally free. So I, I don't pretend that, you know, I, I've got the exclusive corner on all of this. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, as I see this, I have not found a way around three non-negotiables. If you're going to successfully deal with demons, one, you have to be a Christian. I just dealt with someone this last week on the phone first. They wanted me to talk about dealing with demons. They weren't Christian. I spent about 30, 40 minutes, and I said, before you ever even consider talking about challenging demons, even if that's what's going on, if you're not in Christ, all they're going to do is mock you. So you need they need to understand that your authority is greater than theirs, and outside of Christ, they don't fear anyone. So I said, number one, non-negotiable. Are you a Christian? Well, I'm religious. So that's not what I want to know. Are you a Christian? Number two, will you be 100% honest about any of that topos, any of those places, spaces, or territories that you have opened up that ought not to be there and you know it? And then thirdly, will you fight? People that play the victim are doing exactly what demons want. Demon cause passivity. Demon is a manos, what the word meant. I can't. Well, I can't stop this. I can't help myself. I'm the exception. Jesus doesn't watch out for me. It's never going to change because I'm not strong enough. Or whatever it is, I'll go, as soon as you accept the role of victim, you're doing it their way. You need to see yourself as a victor in Christ and be willing to fight. If you're a Christian who will tell the truth and fight, you will win over demonic uh, attack. If you're not a Christian, you need salvation, not demon, not, not, not deliverance. If you're a Christian but you won't tell the truth, you compartmentalize, he can have this but not that. Jesus can have this but not that. I say you're wasting your time. Demons will say, I I'm sorry, but you're the one keeping those doors open because you don't want to surrender some areas to Christ. Or if you're just willing to play the role of the victim, just go ahead and beat me up because there's nothing I can do. You clearly think Jesus is a liar. You clearly do not believe he's going to protect you because you're willing to play the victim. But hmm. assuming they're a Christian who will tell the truth and they will fight. I will then talk to them about the three C's that I write about. I have found three C's, and I do it from memory. Remember, I'm primarily a discipleship trainer. I've spoke for way more years on discipleship lessons than I have just spiritual warfare, to be real honest. Just because of the book I deal, you know, last number of years, it's been a lot on spiritual warfare. But I, I still do conferences, both of them, discipleship, transferable cross-training, and, and spiritual warfare. But I'd like to put things so people remember. So I say three C's. I want you to remember to successfully deal with demons. First, we've got the non-negotiables. Are you a Christian? Will you tell the truth and will you fight? Yes, yes, and yes. Okay. Secondly, are you willing to confess anything and everything that stands between you and God? Yeah, that's that's part of I'll tell the truth. Okay. Confession of sin, first C. Second C, it's dealing with that topos. It's asking God to cancel the ground, cancel the permission Take away that place, space, or territory that was opened up to a demon through my volitional sin. So first I, I asked them, uh, what are we going to deal with? I liken it to going into a house where, you know, some of the lights have been put out. And I said, don't just break the door in. I said, let's take away whatever gives what's ever inside the right to be there. So we're going to pretend like it's fear, because I think that's the one I use in the book as an example in chapter 8. Father, I confess my fear. It's irrational. Uh, I give the, way more credit to the other side than I do you. Uh, my, my instant you know, response is, I, I, I fear everything. It's totally destroying my Christian walk with you. Uh, it's an insult to you. I confess my fear of sin. Please forgive me. First C. Second, and I ask God. I don't forgive my own sin, and I don't forgive their sin. God Almighty is the one who forgives. First John 1 John 1.9 says, we confess our sin. He's what? Faithful and just to forgive our sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Second C, canceling. I asked them to pray, Father in heaven, since I have confessed the sin of, in this case, fear, you can say if, if there are demons that took advantage of me through that, would you please cancel their permission? Will you take that ground back? I surrender that back to you. I do not want demons having any control or space or place in my life in any way. I want you controlling everything in my life. So I've confessed my sin. I've asked God to forgive it. I've asked God, will you close that door that was opened up, cancel it, 
close the door. And then thirdly, you can command demons to leave because they no longer have a right to be there. So the third C is commanding. So confession, I ask God to forgive the sin. Canceling, I ask God to close the door that was open by removing their right to a place or space. Then when you command them to go, they will leave. What I see happen too often is I see people skipping the second part. They will say, I confess my sin, and then they'll say, now demons leave me alone. And a demon's response will be, okay, you've confessed that sin hundreds of times. But you've never admitted you were the one that opened the door in the first place. Yeah. You've never yeah. said that you want that area of your life surrendered back to Christ. You just said, hey, I got caught, and I'm sorry. So when the confession and canceling occur, the commanding follows, and it's not a big deal. So I will, I will say, do you understand those three C's? Yes. I'll write them down on a piece of paper, and every door that we approach, we work through those three C's. So if the second door was, uh, was uh, immorality, they would say, I've got 25 days. I, I don't care about the number. God's omniscient. All you need to say is, Father, I'm giving you everything that has to do with immorality. Uh, well, it doesn't matter with homosexuality, bisexuality, one time, 15, uh, none of that. What you're saying is, God, you know it all. I'm giving all of that to you. I'm asking you to forgive anything and everything that has to do with sexual immorality. I, I never should have gone there. Please forgive me. You've promised when I confess my sin, you'll forgive me and cleanse me. I'm taking you up on your word and your promise. Second C, Father, if that immorality opened doors, that topos, a place or a space for a demon to think I have surrendered that to them so that they have a right, to be involved in my life through that area, would you close that door? Would you cancel any permission demons have in being involved in my life through the immorality? Because I reject them, I resist them, I want nothing to do with that. Third C, I can, I can say then, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command any demons who have been involved with the spongetta through the immorality, from highest to lowest with all of your works and effects, your associates, their works and effects, Leave Spongetta, go to the pit, do not ever come back again. We don't ask that, we command that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll end with, Holy Spirit of God, would you please take control of whatever was just vacated? I surrender that to you. And then if there's another door, we go to the next door. Now, one of the things that I didn't mention that I think I've had people working in this for years that have told me they think it's the single most important thing I wrote in that book. I don't know if it is or isn't, but it's the ground rules. Before I go into a deliverance session with someone, I lay down ground rules. It's saying to the demons, this is how this session is going to go. Uh, it's not going to be a circus. It's not going to be a free-for-all. And you've got the ground rules because you've got the book. But I go through those because what it's telling the demon is, this guy knows what he's doing. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we bind the strong man. He's not going to interfere here. There will be no, no kind of interference no one, no one upline is going to come down and help you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you may speak only that which can be used against you. I don't want a lot of BS. You know, no BS. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be one toy traffic only from Spongetta to the pit. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be no, no vulgarity because they like to swear. So you just cut it off. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not permitted to control uh, Spongetta's mind, her tongue, or her body. She is to be in control of all three at all times. So I no longer, my first two years, I would have people go into contortions, fall on the floor. My missionary friend said, why do you let that happen? I said, I didn't know I could stop it. He said, just lay down in a ground rule that they're not permitted to control their mind, tongue, or body, and they won't. I have not had anybody since 1983, when I've been working with this many times, go into the contortions and the, the saliva and the eyes all rolling up. That stops when you lay down that ground rule because it tells them that isn't going to, you're not permitted to do that. So I work through those ground rules. And what it basically says to the demons is, you're host. <laughs> you're done. Right. And you know it. I, I now, I don't say this as a boast. I'm just saying what I'm going to tell you just straight up. I many times now, when we, when people come in, we're going to wear it. I've had the demons say to me, just get it over with and don't be cruel. Where when wow. I first started working with this, it would be like, you don't have authority to do this, and you're not smart enough to do that. In other words, it was trying to undermine the person or me to think, well, what are we doing? When they know you know what you're doing, their attitude is usually just get it done, which means that the flopping on the floor and the circus is something that does not have to be allowed. And that's why I said when I have my brethren, if they're involved in the battle, I am not going to attack them publicly. And maybe it sounds like I am now. I don't mean it as an attack. I'm just saying 
that doesn't have to go on. Usually, it's because I've had people who work with this say, I appreciated those ground rules because that stuff stopped. But when I was, I never, I didn't know I could stop it. I just figured that was part of how it works because that's what's always happened. I say, well, that's what was happening with me the first two years until my missionary friend said, you can curtail all of that. You lay down in ground rules and it's telling them this is how this session is going to occur. It's not going to be under your control. It's not going to be at your bidding. The only thing you're going to do is respond to the commands I give and you're going to leave. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. So, Brian, it's just a case of identifying the rooms that need to be explored, taking away whatever gave the entities the right to be there, if demons really are, telling them to get lost, surrendering that room back to the full control of the Holy Spirit, and then going to the next door. Hmm. And once you work through their list, typically it's done. Sometimes there'll be an ancestral component to it, which I... I at first, I didn't get much of that at all. My last two decades, I get it all the time. Uh, I just think that's because the people that I now deal with, primarily the kids and grandkids of my generation. My generation in the 60s and 70s was one that said, God is dead, drugs are great, you mm. know, free sex for everyone, et cetera, et cetera. I think we're dealing now with collateral damage with kids and grandkids from my generation. We just had mm. no idea that games we played could open up doors to progeny. Bible talked about it. But if someone says, how do you deal with the ancestral issue? I said, just like the others. Well, what if I don't know what the ancestral issues are? Well, God does. So what's my confession? Uh, Father, you can guess and, and sometimes guess wrong. Or I just pray, Father in heaven, I don't know if ancestral issues are an issue in my life that would give demons that topos. But if it is, would you please forgive any and all ancestral sin? I give that all to you. Would you please cancel any ground, any doors that were open to demons through the sins of ancestry, you've forgiven it, please close that door, and it's commanding any demons involved with ancestral sin to leave. And they'll go just like the others. And then asking the Holy Spirit, please fill and control it. The last thing I deal with, I say in the book, and I reiterate it in chapter 12. If you've got the newest edition, the one that came out in January, it's got 12 chapters now instead of 10. I, I hit this harder because I had so many pastors and missionaries asking me this question. And I thought, okay, clearly I wasn't clear enough in the first edition of it. But basically what I'll say is the last thing I deal with with someone, because I want to I wanna, I wanna believe when they're done, they're done. You know, we didn't miss anything. I don't have a crystal ball. I'm not psychic. Maybe we missed something, right? But what I will say is there is, in, in a demonized person, there's going to be one demon whose job is to organize everybody else and keep them on task. I call them the band leader. I call them the orchestra leader. Sometimes they're mouthy and they want everybody to know they're in charge. Sometimes they're very smart. And they just kind of lay in the weeds, but they just keep everybody else working. I tell them they're kind of like the CEO of a business. So the last one that I will deal with is I will, I will ask a person to pray this way. And, and I'm kind of a, a, a wordsmith on this one. It's important. Uh, but I'll say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father in heaven, I'm asking that you would forgive all the sin and cancel all the ground that's associated or has anything to do with that spirit holding highest authority yet in my life other than the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's going to have highest authority, so I'm not going to say I want to remove uh, whatever spirit has highest authority in my life, I want it gone. Well, first, I couldn't remove the Holy Spirit as a believer anyway, but I certainly don't want the Holy Spirit leaving. I want him controlling all of me. So I qualify it. Would you please forgive all the sin, cancel all of the ground, having anything to do with that spirit holding highest authority in my, or Spongetta's life, other than the Holy Spirit. Okay, they pray that with me. Then we'll say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that spirit holding highest authority dealing with Spongetta, other than the Holy Spirit. The, the sin that opened the door for you has been forgiven. The ground that you held has been taken away. That door is closed, which means now you're a squatter. You have no right to be there. Don't care what your authority was or wasn't in regard to your buddies. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you come forward now. You can tell it to leave, and you take any remaining partners you still have that you've been working with. When you leave, you take all of your buddies with you, so this house is clean, every room. And then when you tell them to go, pray, Holy Spirit of God, would you please now fill and control every room in, in uh, Spongetta's life that was vacated. Spongetta mm -hmm. will walk out the door free of this stuff. The last thing I'll usually do, you've got the stuff on the on the follow-up, not in the process. I've already told you the last thing in the process. That's it. But it's just reminding them, keep short accounts with sin. 
You'll never again be bothered by ancestral sin if you were. They may not have been, but if they were, that's been dealt with. So I'll say keep short accounts with sin because the only way you can open yourself up to demonic control again is by playing games with sin and letting it stack up until you give them what? Topos again, like 426 and 427 Ephesians. So as long as you keep short accounts, that won't happen. I'll tell them, secondly, I want them to enjoy reading their Bible. Why? What do I mean? Most of the time, demonized people read their Bible with great difficulty. It's, it's like I feel like I've got a fly swatter in my hand. I'm trying to read my Bible, but I'm having to get in dive bombs, so many ideas and distractions, and, and it's like something's talking to me. Even as I'm trying to read, I'm getting thoughts like, you're not going to get anything out of this. Read it again. And then you read it again, and it's like, well, why do you waste so much time reading again? You know, It's like you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Uh, it's like the person that says to me, someone said to me, explain that damned if you do, damned if you don't, or maybe there's a better way of saying that. I said, okay, it goes like this in practical terms. A pastor preaches that if you're a faithful believer, you should be sharing your faith all the time, anytime you can. And if you don't do it, you're a spiritual coward. So I feel real convicted and say, okay, I guess I'm a spiritual coward. God, forgive me. I go outside the door. I share with someone. I get so excited. I go back in and tell the pastor, you know, I listened to your sermon and I shared my faith. And I was so excited about it, and uh, they actually wanted to become a Christian. As you're walking out the door, then they start getting blasted with, oh, so you're going to take credit? You're, you're, you're going to take credit for work that only God can do. Mm-hmm. Only God can open up eyes. See, you're still a lousy Christian because you shared your faith, but look how you're bragging about it. So I say, if you don't share your faith, you're a horrible Christian. But if you do share your faith, now you're filled with pride and you're still a horrible Christian. It's like no matter what you do, the other side's going to tell you how you're wrong. You did yeah, something right. wrong. Because there can be no joy or peace in Christ. So anyway, the last thing I'm going to say is when you start reading your Bible, it's going to be quiet. You're going to say uh, whatever you pray before you read your Bible. I typically pray something like, Holy Spirit of God, will you please teach me that I may love God more dearly and be able to share something with someone else that can be helpful to them. Thank you in Jesus' name, and then I dive in. And instead of getting blasted with, oh, you're on the wrong chapter, or oh, it should have been this, or oh, you're a hit, it's just quiet. And I've said to a demonized person who's now free, I say, you're not going to know what to do when it's quiet and you actually enjoy reading your Bible instead of feeling like you're in a battlefield. So keep short accounts with sin, read your Bible, and then pray offensively. If you get those occasional arrows that come at you, instead of running from those arrows, Chad, you're still a loser. Brian, you're still stupid. You're still this, that. Instead of going, oh, no, they're back, and oh, no, I'm, I'm horrible. Just pray it's like you're raising your shield. Father in heaven, if that's a demon telling me I'm stupid, fat, ugly, and whatever, would you just beat the tar out of that sucker? I'm not <laughs> running. It's, it's offensive prayer. It's Psalm 35. It's Psalm 83. It's Psalm 109. It's Psalm 58. It's Jeremiah 18. It's Nehemiah 4. It's where they, when, when David prays, I, I, I mean, there's some of them that are just so classic. When my enemy lays down his, in, his nets to catch me, Lord, catch him in his own nets. That is not a defensive prayer saying, hide me. That's an offensive prayer saying, Lord, go after my enemies. He says, contend against the ones who are trying to contend against me. That's not saying, hide me, Lord. That's saying, go to war against them. When when he says in, the, in the Psalm 58, when my enemies shoot arrows at me, return their arrows and shatter their teeth with their arrows. That's not saying, I'm running from the arrows. That's saying, boomerang those arrows right back at the shooter and bust these teeth out. In other words, send my enemy a message. I'm the wrong one to mess with. So I will say, you start praying offensively instead of running. You keep short accounts with your sin, and you get yourself in your Bible and enjoy reading. More mm-hmm. often than not, what I'll hear afterwards is, those arrows are so obvious now. I mean, it used to be they baffled mm. me or they scared me. Now I just think, what a pathetic loser is trying to bug me again. <laughs> instead of running, I just ask God, will you kick the tar out of the one trying to kick the tar out of me? Will you undermine the one trying to undermine me? And uh, God will. And and I will look back as a believer later and say that was so confusing and so fearful before, and now it's so matter of fact. I'm on the side that won. They're on the side that lost. And I am done putting up with their nonsense, and I am done playing the role of the victim. I'm done with that. Amen. Wow, that's good. Well, thank you for that, Carl. That's excellent. Yes. One question I have is uh, when when the disciples were casting out a, a demon, or trying to cast out a demon, and they couldn't, Jesus uh, says, well, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. And I'm just wondering, 
Uh, now, maybe there's some dispute over whether they're prayer or prayer and fasting, but what is your thoughts on that? And are, in your experience, are there certain things that uh, require more than just, you know, a prayer time, that kind of a thing? Great question. Glad you asked it. I'll go back to the verse that, you know, when I, when I sign books, I put the same verse in it, have done it since I wrote that book. Luke 10, 18 to 20. Very important verse, not written just to the 12, which takes care of that excuse. Well, mm -hmm. this must have just been the original 12. No, sorry. But uh, I have given you authority to tread upon the serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. They shall in no wise harm you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice because spirits are subject to you. Rejoice because your name is recorded in heaven. The authority that Christ delegated to anyone whose name is recorded in heaven, he says is over all the power of the enemy. He doesn't qualify it. Serpents, scorpions, all the power of the enemy. So when someone wants to say, are there some that will only come out with fasting? Uh, you didn't ask for this, but heck, we're, we're running over. I'll give you the story anyway. <laughs> I was on one of the interviews. I don't remember. Moody uses me quite a little bit, which I'm glad. I, I like Moody. Uh, their, their radio programs. Janet Parshall, she's a She's a jewel, but yeah. uh, I high kudos for her. But at any rate, someone had called me in on one of the Q and A things, and it was a pastor. He said, "I'm 76. I'm a pastor." I said, "Hi, pastor," and he said, uh, "I work with this." And I said, "Fantastic," and uh, and uh, I'm glad. And he says, "Well, I'm just curious why you didn't talk about fasting." And that none of your answers have you mentioned fasting. And in Matthew 17, which is the passage you're talking about, Brian mentions fasting and then this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting and uh and he said i have found that when i fast a week before i work with somebody i'm very effective in deliverance but if i don't fast for a week i'm not very effective with deliverance so he said i'm just curious what what you have to say about fasting and i said well pastor i mean this with all respect because i'm you know your pastor you're older than me i'm glad you're in the battle but i said First, in Matthew 17, the, the word fasting isn't in the better manuscripts. Any good study Bible, you already knew that. That's why you qualified that, Brian. Any mm -hmm. good study Bible is going to say fasting isn't in the text, which it's not. So for, for lovers of the King James, if that's the only Bible they'll read, that's your, 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 your orthodoxy is now in question because you've doubted something in the King James. But uh, I said, <laughs> well, I, 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 can, I can run to the Greek text and... You know, actually, the right. Greek, Greek text probably stands stronger than the 1611 edition, to be real honest. Anyway, but just it's not there. But I asked the pastor, I said this, I said, Pastor, I don't think you meant to say what you said. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, how many, I asked him, I said, how many times do you deal with people that are demonized? And he said, two or three, three or four times a year. And I said, well, and I can see how you could fast for each person a week. I said, someone like me, I said, I've had times I work with two or three people in a day. And I said, certainly in a week or a month. And I said, if I made a commitment to fast for a week for every person that I have would work with, I would be dead because it would mean I could never eat. <laughs> and I said, so that's a problem. But I said, here's the bigger problem. Do demons leave when they're commanded to leave because you fasted or because you have delegated authority from Christ to tell them to leave? which Jesus said is over all the power of the enemy, which means wherever they are in rank, whether they're real strong ones or little scraggly, you know, grunts, they all fall under all serpents, scorpions, and all the power of the enemy. So I said, are you truly believing that they leave because of the work you have done of fasting? And if you don't fast, then they won't obey your command. Or do they leave because your name is recorded in heaven and you're a delegated ambassador to Christ? And he said, well, it's because I'm a delegated ambassador of Christ. I said, so what I'm saying is if you want to fast for people, that's fine. I'm not saying don't. But I'm saying your fasting no more makes you more or less effective in exercising authority you've been delegated uh, than if somebody says uh, you can know your sins are forgiven when you cry after you confessed it because that meant you were fully repentant. So if I don't cry, I'm not a crier, then I guess I wasn't fully repentant. So what do I do? Now I pray again about the same thing. And then if demons are involved, they're going to shoot a little arrow. It says, why would you pray a second time about something God answered the first time unless you don't really trust God to forgive your sin? You better confess your unbelief now. So in other words, it's just all more of a game. So yeah. if you want to fast, that's fine. 
Now, the, the question about, again, that ties with it, how come? I'm going to give you a guess. I tell people I don't have this in the text, so I'm not going to answer it as if I, you know, I, I'm solid. If it's in the text, I'll stand on it. I don't care if you like it or don't like it. It's what the text yeah. is. I give an account to God, not you. But there are right. some things where I go, we make we make assumptions, but here's my guess. My guess is Jesus wasn't with the group. I think that group had gotten used to watching Jesus tell demons to get lost. I think that they thought that demons would respond to them in his absence because they knew we belong to Jesus. You know, we're part of his crew. Now, they hadn't yet received the Holy Spirit. We're told later, you know, he breathed them. So I think that you had a group of guys, it's almost like, in the name of Jesus, who is my buddy, you're going to leave. And it's like, Jesus, I know, who are you? Mm. Uh, in other words, mm. I think their confidence was not in, I belong to Christ, and I am indwelt by God, and I have been delegated authority over you. I think it was more, we're part of the group, and since we're part of the group, you're going to hop too. And I think their response was, I don't care what group you're, do you, do you understand your authority? I don't think they did. Hmm. I think that's why the demons fought him. And I think when Jesus came back, I think he saw what went on. And that's why he says, oh, you have little faith. It's like, come on. Uh, you know, don't, don't you understand by now? It's not the work you do for me. It's the work I have done for you. It's yeah. not your power on your own. It's on what you do because I live in you and work through you. So I can't prove that. I don't know that that's true, but I have read that with curiosity. And I just thought, I wonder if they thought they were doing this as kind of a groupy thing mm -hmm. uh, because I'm part of the group, but failing to realize the one they were fearful of was Christ. And Christ yeah. was with three others up on the Mount of Transfiguration at the time. So the demons were like, we don't, we fear your boss, but we don't fear you. Mm. Now, as a believer, because you have been delegated authority from the boss, says Luke 10, 18 to 20, they have to fear you just like they fear the boss because he delegated his authority to you to tell them to get lost. Oh, yeah. it's only the 12. No, read 17. The 70 return with joy saying even spirits are subject to us in your name. Clearly that went way beyond just the 70. Or how about a Luke 9, 49 and 50? says uh, it's Peter and John, but they say, Jesus, we see people casting demons out, but they're not part of our group. Should we tell them to stop? What do you tell them? Leave them alone. Right. Yeah. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. Let them do what they're doing. Clearly, that delegated authority was broader than just the 12. Well, that's a really helpful answer. I, I think that it uh, it's encouraging to me because it, that verse always would be a niggle in my mind, like, well, uh, Wait, I'm am I still struggling with something because uh you know I now this is one of those ones that just you know I can't can't beat this because uh I maybe I haven't done enough work. I haven't have done enough prayer and fasting that kind of a thing. Carl, we really appreciate you coming on to the podcast today. Thank you so much. We'll direct people to your website transferablecrosstraining.org. Is there any other places where people might find your resources obviously for your books or any other uh, materials? Well, the, the Spiritual Warfare book is, I mean, Amazon bookstores, they, they can get that if they, you know, just look for that in my name. The website, transferablecrosstraining.org, or if they forget that, they can just go carlpain.org. They'll both connect to the same one. The discipleship series that I sell, I sell that at the church, through the church, and I've been doing that since 82. So, until wow. I've been writing, I've been writing that stuff a long time. So, right, <laughs> if I have people that are interested in in a, a discipleship series, book one I call the essentials, book two I call the apologetics, book three I call it leadership. They're welcome to any of it or all of it. I'll say it again; they'll find a lot of very similar verses. There's a lot of discipleship material out. I don't pretend that it's unique that way. If there's anything unique, again, it's if it isn't transferable, I don't care. If, if someone waxes eloquently and I walk away going, I could never repeat all that, too complex, I'll say, then you haven't helped me. You've discouraged mm. me. So if there's, it's just the, the lessons are very uh, self-contained in each lesson, and you can hand them off to somebody else. And uh, someone else done a better job probably on every subject I cover. There's probably someone done a better job, but 
but at least uh, it'll give them an arrow in their quiver to say, if this question comes up, I think I can jump in instead of failing to jump in and then just feeling guilty that I didn't jump in. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would rather at least try to jump in. So they, they can get that through the website if they're interested. Great. Well, we'll link to those in the show notes. And for those listening, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you have a question you'd like us to address or just a message for us, feedback, good or bad, you can either email us at podcast at apologetics315.com or leave a voice message for us using SpeakPipe. Just go to speakpipe.com slash apologetics315 to leave us a message. And remember, if you include a Ghostbusters quote in your question, we guarantee that we'll read it on the podcast. We also ensure up to 50% better quality answers. Also, if you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave a review in iTunes or the podcast platform of your choice. And please share this episode with a friend if you found it useful. Remember, you can find lots of apologetics resources at apologetics315.com, along with show notes for today's episode. Find Chad's apologetic stuff over at Truth Bomb Apologetics. That's truthbomb.blogspot.com. This has been Brian Auten and Chad Gross for the Apologetics 315 podcast, and thanks for listening. The General Insurance presents Shower Ballads by Shaq. And I'm gonna keep balancing you, cause it's the only thing I wanna do. Turns out, everyone does sound better in the shower. And it turns out, The General is a quality insurance company that's been saving people money for nearly 60 years. For a great low rate and nearly 60 years of quality coverage, make the right call and go with the general. Some restrictions apply. The first all-civilian mission to orbit the Earth is also raising millions of dollars for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Learn about Inspiration 4 on St. Jude Mission of a Lifetime. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.